This is the Comics Alternative Interviews, a conversation with Leela Corman. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Comics Alternative Interviews. I'm Derek. And I'm Andy, and we're two guys with PhDs talking about comics. And on this episode, we have the pleasure of talking with Leela Corman. Her new book, We All Wish for Deadly Force, was recently released from Retrofit Big Planet. But before we get to that conversation, we want to let all of you guys know that this episode of the Comics Alternative Interviews is brought to you by the great folks at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website, dcbservice.com, for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. There, you're going to find all DC, Marvel, Image, and Dark Horse titles at 40% off of the cover price if you pre-order. With all the other publishers, you'll find that those discounts are 20 to 35% off of the cover price. And every month, you're going to find some wonderful specials. Sometimes those specials will be at 45% off cover price, sometimes at 50% off cover, but often you can find discounts that go higher than that. That's right, and and this month, since we're talking to Leela Corman, you can find on DCV Service the book we're going to be talking about, We All Wish for Deadly Force, for 30% off. So you can find that for $7, so check that out at dcbservice.com. Yeah, that's a great way of getting the book from uh, the creator we're going to be talking to in a few minutes. Go to dcbservice.com, where you can find We All Wish for Deadly Force and other comics. Go there for all of your comics pre-ordering needs, and after you do get your comics there, please do send them an email and tell them that the two guys with PhDs sent you. That's right. Andy, this was a fun conversation we had with Leela. Um, You know, I'm familiar and have been for a while with her novel-length work, Unterzanken, but it had been a long time since I had read some of her shorter works like she had published earlier in her career, like around 2002, 2003. Yeah, yeah. So, so this, is a, this is an interesting conversation to talk about these recent um, uh, shorter works that are collected in uh, We All Wish for Deadly Force. Yeah. Well, let's go ahead and get into that conversation. We have the pleasure of having on the Comics Alternative, Leela Corman. Her new book, We All Wish for Deadly Force, was released in June by Big Planet Retrofit. Leela, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. You know, one of the first questions that I have is, uh, now this book is a collection of your previously published shorter comics, and, and we see at the beginning of the book that they... The comics originally appeared in places like Tablet, The Nib, uh, Women's Review of Books. Um, I'm curious, which stories uh, appeared in which publications? Uh, Was there like certain kinds of stories that appeared in one that maybe were not in the other? Yeah, so uh, I do a lot of stuff for Tablet, and that, that work tends to have to have a Jewish theme somewhere in there. Um. The PTSD story was for Nautilus, which is a really beautiful science magazine. I was really honored to be in that. The Nib is a really good place to pitch stuff that sometimes it's topical. They do a lot of political comics. But uh, if I have a kind of a cultural thing that isn't really tied necessarily to Jewish issues or, you know, Nautilus is the only thing I've ever done that was science related. Um, the nib tends to be a good place for that. The women's review of books piece was a commission. Uh, they, they found me, I, I believe it was the cartoonist, Jennifer Camper, who, um, asked me to do that piece. Okay. Um, now the, the PTSD story, that's the, the one that opens the collection, the wound that never heals. Yeah. Yes. Now, uh, to me, 
uh, given some of the, I get your history over the past few years, it just seemed to me that this was the perfect story to to open with. Was there any ever ever any question in your mind that this story, the wound that never heals, would not open the book? Uh, no, not when I started finally laying out the book because uh, I'm a little bit sadistic in my work, <laughs> and I uh, at this point I. I'm into dropping bombs on people, uh, metaphorically speaking. I'm very <laughs> against that in real life on the physical plane, but I'm very all for it in art and storytelling. I, I believe in hurting people a little bit because they can take it. You, you say that in, in one of the stories, too, that you have a kind of dark sense of humor. Is that factor into that? Oh, who doesn't have a dark sense of humor? <laughs> Find me someone who doesn't have a dark sense of humor. <laughs> I could think of maybe one person I've ever met. Huh. Anyone else? Anyone else except for this one woman? <laughs> if they say they don't have a dark sense of humor, they're lying. <laughs> now we should mention to our listeners that uh, the story that we were referring to, the wound that never heals, as well as almost every other <laughs> comic in this collection, uh, deals either directly or indirectly with the death of your first daughter, Rosalie. Um, and our, our listeners uh, should be familiar with that uh, history. Uh, we actually talked with your husband, Tom, early this year when his memoir, Rosalie Lightning, was published uh, in an extremely moving book. Uh, so while he was working on that longer narrative or what became that longer memoir, uh, you seem to be addressing this this gigantic loss in your life through these shorter pieces. Did you find that a uh, an effective way, as, or as one could <laughs> effectively deal with this, of, of actually handling uh, and representing your grief? You know, uh, that's a good question. I think that most of us would tell you that we come to our work accidentally, we fall into it. Um, I didn't mean to go back to doing autobiographical comics, short ones, especially really any at all after I did Unterzock uh, a few years ago. And it's funny, actually, I just had the occasion to look at it at some interviews that I did right after that book came out where I said, I'm never going to do autobiographical work and I don't do short comics. And I do fiction and long form. And, and that's true. I'm working on something that is those things right now, but I found myself right around the time I got pregnant with my second daughter getting ideas for short pieces and finding outlets to pitch them. So it was sort of a combination. This is, might sound kind of disappointing on one level. The disappointing part is <laughs> maybe that it, there are more outlets now that are hiring cartoonists to do short work, and that's a really good way to keep doing your job mm -hmm. uh, as a cartoonist. But the less disappointing answer to that is – that just seemed to be where that stuff wanted to come out. I have no doubt that it will come out in my fiction in some way, but when you make fiction, uh, you, you, you're you making stuff up. So what, what comes into it, there's, there's a kind of an alchemy to that process that is a little bit opaque. So whatever way it comes in, I can't predict. With... With these shorter pieces, in some cases, I just felt compelled to do the, the work first, and then I found a home for it. Mm. Uh, but in other cases, it was just a really good meeting point of uh, an idea that would work as a pitch for a specific publication and something I wanted to explore. The Nautilus piece is a really good example of that, because I wanted to explore the neurobiology of, of trauma a little bit. Mm -hmm. Honestly, that's a subject that could be endlessly explored in comics or prose in, in, in any way. Mm -hmm. Like that piece was way too short for, for what I found and for what else is out there. You know, there's, there's a lot of discussion, especially kind of in the academic circles surrounding comics and comic studies about comics being, particularly well suited for dealing with traumatic experiences and and one of one of the ways that often gets talked about that I think we kind of see in uh the wound that never heals is that 
um, comics aren't necessarily tied to um, a narrative format. You don't or, you, or narrative you know style. You don't have to be telling a story uh, with the sequential images. Um, but I'm wondering if, if how you see comics in the kind of broader sense uh, being a good place to deal with or, or address issues of trauma. Well, I think any art form is a good place to address is- issues of trauma, but it would come out differently in each one. So while right. you were while you were talking just now, I was thinking about what you were saying in the context of film and thinking, yeah, I guess if you, if you made a film that had that kind of jumping around in imagery, mm-hmm. it would be extremely disjointed. It would be like... Mm-hmm. Pull my daisy. If you've ever seen that, movie. <laughs> yeah. uh, at which is not about trauma, but is you know mm-hmm. any one of those sort of movies that's a bunch of disjointed imagery that looks really cool, but uh-huh. if it's telling you a story, it's a very indirect one, uh, or possibly not even intentionally telling you a story. But you can be very intentional in comics without, um, while being a little disjointed in the imagery. I guess is what you're saying. Or you can be very straightforward. That's the thing. You can move back and forth between those two states, narratively mm-hmm. speaking. Yeah, and you don't lose the audience in the way that that could that could happen with film. And I think think one of the one of the things you touched on there that's really important is that to not not necessarily say that comics are better than another medium, but that as you said, you get a different result in different mediums and there's some things comics can do that other media can do like a film could do, but, um, you don't see it. You wouldn't see it as much and it would be, um, it would be a different experience for the reader. Whereas the reader could be more used to, uh, different, uh, different approaches to narrative or non-narrative sequences in comics. I would be curious to hear, uh, the response of a reader who's not also a cartoonist, yeah. you know, to something like that and to a film and to maybe a piece of music, because each art form is tapping into a different corner of your emotional center, or your intellectual center or some combination, you know, um, and we have a physical response to any art that we're looking at or listening to. So, I mean, I'm tempted to say comics are participatory in a way that yeah. the other art forms I mentioned aren't, but I don't think that's true, actually. I don't think that's accurate. Hmm. Uh, that's funny that you say you say that, that because after reading, um, after reading, we are we all wish for deadly force. I I came up with an idea that I really want to do now because I just finished working on a project on autobiographical comics, and I haven't taught a class on it yet, and I teach comic classes in a college and I really now want to put get use that book and Rosalie Lightning together for a unit in that um, in a class on that and see how that that works so I would definitely in that class it would be a gen ed class so I'd be getting students who may be not familiar with comics and I could gauge that reaction yeah I'd be really curious to hear it and especially in comparison with other art forms I just think as you say, comics aren't better. They're, they're just mm-hmm. different. It's just a different delivery system for storytelling. Right. Now, um, as I mentioned, many of the of the comics in one form or another in We All Wish for Deadly Force uh, have something to do with your first daughter, Rosalie. But there are also a number of stories that deal – uh, more directly with your uh, your own Jewishness or your family history, and I'm thinking in particular of uh, stories like This Way to Progress, Irreducibles, Yurtzeit, and uh, one that I think is a, is a great way to end this book, uh, The Book of the Dead. Um, so it, it seems that this is something – now, my guess is that those are the stories that were collected in Tablet. Yes. Originally, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, do you feel that having recently published We All Wish for Deadly Force, and given your previous work, specifically Unterzaken, that 
you run the risk of being pigeonholed as a Jewish cartoonist, and maybe along with that, a cartoonist after the death of your first daughter who now writes about trauma. Well, hey, we can't really control how we're pigeonholed, and being a female artist has made me pigeonholed as a female cartoonist for my entire career. So, you know, how much do I fight that? I don't know. Il faut manger, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I was thinking of that in light of the your comment to, uh, to, to Andy about different kind of art forms and how, you know, one may or may not deal with a certain experience, a traumatic event uh, in, a, in a better way or maybe in a different way than others. Because then that, that got me to thinking about uh, your earlier book that came out in 2012, Untersachen. I've never done this, but it just strikes me that this would be the perfect book to include in a course on – I don't know, maybe a Jewish narrative so or Jewish-American narrative because you could use it right alongside uh, works by Abraham Kahan, Enzian Yuzerska, uh, Mary Anton. I mean, it, it's just right there with it. I mean, you're talking about very similar experiences, but through a different medium form of storytelling. Um, and, I, and I think that that's great, but I wonder for for someone who writes about a particular topic or experience, whether it be gender, ethnic, or even trauma related, if after a while there's this sense of regret that you're being read solely uh, within you know a particular uh, prism. Well, I don't think that that my readership is limited to people who are studying my work in a class. Mm -hmm. So, however, uh, teachers want to use my work. I'm honored, you know. Uh, I'm always <laughs> interested, sometimes amused, and, and often a bit abashed at where my work gets used in people's curricula. Because I kind of want to say, especially with Untersachen, I made it up. I mean, it's totally research-based, you know, <laughs> but it's a work of fiction. So, like, if you're looking for very authentic, specific depictions of New York City, in, say, 1912, you'll get that to an extent, but then there's things you won't get. It will be incomplete, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, like you couldn't hand that book to somebody, to a time traveler, and say, recreate New York in 1912 from this book. What would you get? You'd get a brothel. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, kind of based on reality. But uh, I think I, I, I try to be very authentic to human experience, which I think does not change. Human nature doesn't change. Uh, I don't. I don't really worry about about that aspect of my my legacy. You know, I'm too young to think about my legacy for one thing, <laughs> and I think I'm too unformed as an artist, actually, still. Um, and probably I will think that until I'm dead. But I trust my ideas, and I trust my my work, and the places that I'm capable of going in it. Hmm. I, I, I know that there will always be somebody interested in reading it. So whatever 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 path it takes after I release it is really not up to me so much. You know? However, I will say uh no one is in danger of mistaking my work for you know pigeonholing it in a religious way, for example, right? <laughs> and, and like, I'm, I'm obviously really not religious and I really suck at that aspect of being Jewish. And I don't care, but <laughs> like, that's fine. But I'm quite happy to be part of this continuum of culturally Jewish artists and cartoonists and writers. I'm a lot of other things too. You know, I, I know what subculture I come from very strongly. And I think it's obvious if you know me. But I'm I'm really, really happy to be part of that tradition. It's venerable. And I'm so glad that it's always growing. You know, there are a lot of us. And when you were, by the way, uh, listing other works that you would include in that curriculum, there's another book that springs to mind. And unfortunately, I can't remember the title, but I'm bringing it up because it if you're going to create this now hypothetical, hopefully mm -hmm. real in the future curriculum, mm -hmm. uh, it's it's like mine, uh, something that's more contemporary, but somebody writing a work of fiction about life on the Lower East Side. It is a novel set around the time of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire, because one of the characters dies in that fire, um, by a lesbian writer about a lesbian couple in the tenements in this time period. And it's great. 
and I will find it for you. Just okay. From- Definitely send me the reference. <laughs> Now, I'm curious. You said that uh, your books have, have been taught in ways you hadn't thought of. What are some of those ways? Uh, what are some of those classes that your work, Unterzaken and otherwise, have been taught? Uh, being taught at all is the first surprise. Okay. <laughs> and my first response when someone told me they were teaching Unterzaken was, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I really appreciate it. I, I just, it's interesting to me that people are teaching it because I think, like, what are you teaching from it? Like, I don't understand. <laughs> I'd love to know sometime. That would be really interesting. Like, could I be a fly on the wall in that class? Uh, and I don't mean that in a narcissistic way. I mean, I'm really curious uh, what academics get out of that book. Uh, I'm not sure that goes anywhere towards your question. <laughs> You're asking me what's let – me, let me make sure I understand. You're asking me what is surprising. Or no, you, you said that people have you, you, people have told you that they've used it in class, oh, okay. and you're just a little surprised that they would use it or use it in particular classes. I mean, what kind of classes? What kind of tor- courses? I, I'm assuming something that maybe maybe a literature class, but perhaps in a history course as well, uh, pop culture studies, uh, ethnicity studies. I think all of the above. Maybe not pop culture. I, I think I'm not sure. I really my work really bears much relation to anything going on in pop culture. I think I'm kind of hopelessly out of step in that regard, but maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Uh, I do know that if I tend to like something, it tends to not be popular. And I don't mean that as a compliment. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not trying to say I'm cool. I'm trying to say, I really have no idea what people go for, but, um, and I've never had my finger on any pulse. Um, yeah, I think, uh, gender studies, ethnic studies, history, Jewish American life. Uh, I hope, I really hope that it's not being taught in some kind of women cartoonists ghetto mm-hmm. <laughs> because the, the gender segregation in comics really bugs me. And the fact that we still have it uh, really infuriates me. But academia, I know, is a little bit different. To tell you the honest truth, I don't even know the full extent to which people are teaching my work. I get emails occasionally or like find out that there's a paper in some academic journal about my book. And I'm like, oh, really? Okay. <laughs> Or somebody will tell me, oh, yeah, we read your class. We read your book in my, you know, junior year, whatever, fill in the blank class. And I'm always surprised. One of one of the things that I was thinking about when I was reading, um, reading the new book was that and and thinking about it from a teaching perspective is the the different also the different media and styles you use. Uh, Could you talk a little bit about. The, the different choices you make in terms of, you know, uh, pen and ink versus watercolor versus colored pencils and so on. Yeah. So it's actually brush and ink. I'm okay. very strict about that. Uh, I, I don't draw with pens, although I much respect to the pen. <laughs> <laughs> it's a number two round. I started out making comics in ink and I really love ink. Uh, I think most cartoonists would tell you we have kind of a mystical relationship to it. But over the last couple of years, I started wanting to experiment with color, and I really don't like using digital color in comics. Uh, It's a very uninteresting process to me. I trained as a painter originally, Hmm. so it didn't occur to me immediately to paint my comics when I started wanting to break away from black and white. I... I started the colored pencil thing just to play around, you know, and I was also playing around with not using panel borders and and moving across the page in a different way. Uh, That's an experiment that I've concluded, I think. I I prefer using panel borders for the most part, but I'm glad I did it. And I really enjoyed using the colored pencils and layering with them. I, I was able to get some effects that I was really interested in. But the watercolor thing happened right around the time that I pitched that Nautilus story. I just did a couple of little experimental pages that actually are in the book. It's that piece called I'm with someone who knows you. Uh, When Aiden Koch came to give a workshop at saw, I dropped in and I just kind of joined in one day and did those pages. And I realized, Oh yeah, I could be painting my comics instead of lamenting the fact that I don't have time to be a painter and a cartoonist. And that I really miss painting, which I do. I really love painting. It was my first love and my reasons for not becoming a painter are kind of twisted. But I just decided to do that Nautilus piece in watercolor and see what happened. And 
it was like this lightning bolt hit me because all of a sudden I remembered that I'm a really good watercolorist and that's kind of where I lived as an artist at one point in my much earlier life. It's a completely different relationship with the paper. It's a completely different biochemical relationship with making mm-hmm. the art that became very addictive to me in the past year. And now it's all I want to do. I don't want to work in ink at all. So that Irreducibles piece, that's kind of uh, the midpoint where I'm using both. I mm-hmm. will probably at some point fall back in love with black ink and I'll <laughs> be saying all this stuff about ink maybe in five years after I finish my next book completely in watercolor. Maybe I'll never want to look at it again. <laughs> but, uh, but that's the direction I'm moving right now. Was the last story, The Book of the Dead, also done in that way that you did Irreducibles? Uh, no ink on that story. Yeah. There's no ink in that. It's wow. pencil and watercolor and gouache. Okay. Hmm. And that was the the most recent piece in the book also. What, The Book of the Dead? Yeah, I did that in, I think, May. Wow. Hmm. <laughs> that is fresh. Yeah. Yeah. That book was put together rather quickly. Well, I think, it, I mean, that's an, it just struck me in reading this that that is uh, an appropriate way of ending this book because you're dealing with many of the topics, many of the themes that you had been among the other stories in this collection, but you bring it back home, your experiences in your own life, your family history, bring it back to what it means to you as an artist. It, 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 it may be as problematic as that can be. Uh, maybe problematic is not the right word, but uh, you, you seem to be saying that y- y- what you're doing may not have the gravitas the weight that your ancestors would would look kindly on, at least you're imagining that, but it's what you do, uh, which is, I think it's a perfect way to send us out of this text. Yeah. I mean, I guess I did say that, but it's funny that the reaction that got after that story came out, there were some hilarious comments from people trying to mansplain that shit to me. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, look, baby, it's okay. It's all right. I got this covered. I made these decisions a while ago. I'm pretty happy with my life as an artist, actually, you know. Uh, But no, I mean, there was a point last spring where I was thinking a lot about usefulness and uselessness. Uh, So I was just trying to process some of those feelings. I don't actually believe it's useless to be an artist. Otherwise, I never would have become one. I'm just not kidding myself about its usefulness. It's kind of relative, you know. It's a thing you get to do when you're not completely consumed by survival issues. Mm-hmm. Well, I think anybody who doesn't have a job that involves, say, you know, saving people's lives on a daily basis probably <laughs> struggle, struggles with the question of usefulness, right? Right. I mean, you guys are both academics, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. We, okay. <laughs> something we re- wrestle with constantly. <laughs> I'm thinking of this friend of mine here who just became a forest firefighter. Mm. And I've been following her on Instagram as she fights some huge wildfire in Idaho. <laughs> I'm like, go Shana. I'm just going to keep sitting here looking at your Instagram feed. <laughs> yeah, I, I have a friend who's my age who just went through some training to be a like a volunteer emergency search and rescue person in, you know, in the mountains in Washington and stuff. And I was like, yeah, well, I, I'm not I'm not doing that. <laughs> Maybe I am doing something for people, but I'm not not doing that. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. It's all right. Your ancestors forgive you. Yeah. Well, my teachers are my family's full of teachers, so they all understand. <laughs> well, something you you also do, Leela, is belly dancing, and that <laughs> is an art form that is represented quite uh, abundantly in this collection. Yeah. Yeah. And I I was curious. Now, there's some stories here in We All Wish for Deadly Force that deal directly with your experiences in belly dancing. And probably the best example of that is Brooklyn Belly Dance Adventure. Uh, But then there are a couple of them that really stand out to me, and those are the two Luna stories. Uh, There's the Luna of Cairo, and then there's the Belly Dancer's President. And it, it strikes me that I guess it, well maybe let me uh, get to this by asking you a question. Do you feel that those are the two 
works of fiction or the closest works of fiction in this collection? Well, they're not. They're not fiction at all. Mm. Uh, they're they're completely uh, non-fictional. Luna is a friend of mine who went to Cairo on a Fulbright in 2008 and never came back. Uh, well, you know, she comes back for vacation. But she that's her stage name. We don't use her oh. real name in the stories. Uh, she's a dance class friend of mine from New York who was already kind of getting on the circuit in a in a bigger way than a lot of us would have in belly dance in in the US and then she she already spoke Egyptian Arabic and and was already kind of on an academic track she got this Fulbright she was going to go write a book uh she stumbled on a dance contract somebody offered her a dance contract in Cairo and she just never came back like i said she just stayed so I found her stories really interesting. She has a, a blog that's really fun to read and a little controversial. She doesn't really sugarcoat her opinions of things, and she's she's been in Egypt long enough that she has really strong feelings about it. She was there through the revolution and the coup and the counter-coup or whatever you call it and everything that's going on. Uh, so it was just a really interesting um, time period there. And she had a ringside seat. So I suggested we work together. Hmm. That's interesting. I, um, I guess there's no indication in either of those pieces that this, this is a story of someone else's life. And given the fact that most of the other stories in the book are based on your own experiences primarily, I just thought that maybe this was a fictional way of masking uh, some experiences that you may have had or maybe kind of a blending of your own life and fiction in some way. So huh. I'm surprised to hear that you thought it was fiction because, for example, that gang rape that happened in Tahrir Square that we talk about was all over the news a couple of years ago when it took place. Or it could be fiction based on, on real events. It's just that you've taken events, historical events, whether it be based on your own life or maybe someone else's, and then created a narrative around that. And, and that's the way I read those stories. But, you know, now that you explain this, uh, it, it makes perfect sense because, I mean, both of those stories um, are very poignant when you said that uh, your friend can be quite opinionated on, on her experiences over in Egypt. That definitely comes out in these pieces. Yeah, uh, those are her words completely. Wow. Mm. Okay. Yeah. And uh, except for the place where, where we quoted women in the second story, mm -hmm. I asked her to go and talk to some people that she was friends with and, and get their direct quotes. And those are completely unedited. I, I didn't want to take away from their words. I wanted to just leave them there, whether you agree or disagree or freaked out by the difference of opinion, especially in the younger belly dancer uh, who is repeating a set of opinions that are very widely held in some quarters in Egypt, but that I think would be surprising to most Americans to hear. Hmm. Now, where did those comics originally appear? Those both ran in the nib. In the nib, okay. Yeah. Now, now for those stories, these aren't the only ones that you use panelist borders, but uh, or uh, borderless panels, excuse me. But um, <laughs> but for both of the but for both of the belly dancing stories, you do uh, you don't use uh, panel borders. Is is there something connected to maybe that you know the, the one art form that you're writing about in comics that uh, that makes that choice? Uh, useful or appropriate or effective? No, I think at the time I was just experimenting visually. I just wanted to play around and see what happened. Okay, so from an academic perspective, someone can go ahead and write a paper on the effectiveness of that without, <laughs> without having authorial intention to worry about. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny that you bring that up. <laughs> the one academic paper written about my work that I did read was quite good, actually. But, um, she she writes about Untersachen, and and she picked up on a lot of things that I that were definitely intentional, but that I didn't um, make explicit. Uh -huh. And that was great. But then she goes on for a while about the work's relationship to anti-Semitic caricature. And of the time period and, and more recently and all this stuff. And, you know, she's talking about the way I drew the characters' faces and their noses. 
And I wanted to say to her, sweetheart, you could have just asked me. <laughs> I'll notice like that because I think they're sexy. <laughs> I mean, this is a thing. Okay, so like word to you academics out there. If the artist is alive, ask them first before you make assumptions about their intentions, because your interpretation may be completely fantastical. Huh. It's worth asking. But it, it that's interesting because that does point to something that I find, um, you know, unique about working in, in comic studies is that, you know, when – in those cases when the creator is still alive, you do have – you have better access than you might in other, you know, in other literary studies areas. Yeah. I, I mean, Eric, Eric – deal, or excuse me, Derek deals with Philip Roth and you probably – I don't know how, how often you, you get a chance to talk to Philip Roth, but it's a lot easier to do that in comics it seems. Will he talk to you? Yeah, I've talked to him a few times, <laughs> corresponded with him. Um <laughs> Uh, I, but usually when I do, it's it's not to ask him an interpretive question of, <laughs> of one of his works. Uh, I, I do feel that – because I, I do a lot of work in contemporary narrative, whether it be comics or otherwise. And so whereas – I know Andy – in fact, Andy and I first met in graduate school, and in, he does a lot of work in British modernism. And so obviously a lot of the authors that he's dealt with – throughout his career, have been dead for yeah. a while. Me, I've dealt with a lot of uh, contemporary people uh, very much alive. And there have been experiences where I've contacted them asking a question, as, Leela, you're suggesting this this scholar should have done with you. And I've could, learned, have could, have could have done. Could have done, could have done, I guess. <laughs> and, and, and I've learned that maybe my interpretation was a tad off or sometimes even spot on. Uh, I, I just find it interesting. T to me, it, the, the most interesting experience of that is I was at a conference a number of years ago where there was a panel devoted to um, uh, teaching August Wilson's drama. And um, August Wilson actually appeared at the panel uh, as an audience member. Uh, there was a rumor going around oh, no. that, he, that he might show up because he lived right nearby. And – Lo and behold, he, he was there, and so the room was packed, and during the entire panel, because they had three people presenting p papers on how they teach his, his drama, uh, I kept noticing people in the audience would look back to where Wilson was sitting – as oh, if God. to say, is this true? You know, <laughs> it's, uh, or, or is their interpretation correct? And he was uh, strategically silent, uh, really didn't say anything during the panel <laughs> except when someone asked him a question about what he thought at one point. And he goes, I really enjoy what you guys are saying about my work. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. I have a lot. Go ahead. I, sorry, I could see that being very terrifying for everybody on the panel. <laughs> that's, a, that's a bit of a psych out game, huh? Oh, yeah. That's something they didn't sign up for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I have a lot of anxiety about this because I'm doing a paper at a conference coming up, and the paper uh, deals somewhat with with Justin Green's work, and and Carol Tyler is one of the guests at the at the event, who's Justin Green's wife. So I don't know if Justin will be there or not, or if I can stop during the presentation and ask, you know, is this true? <laughs> is this is this ac Am I being accurate here? Well, the good thing about Carol is that she's very cool. Yeah, she is. <laughs> <laughs> she'll, I'm sure she'd talk to you. <laughs> but she'd also probably tell me if I was dead wrong. Too. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, she would. <laughs> I would hope. God. Yeah. <laughs> but in front of everybody is what I worry about. <laughs> oh, she's a gracious person. No, I, I like her a lot. <laughs> More gracious than she needs to be, frankly. <laughs> to this world. <laughs> talk about underrated women, Carol. I don't think she's ever gotten her due as a cartoonist. No, no. And, and you know, Soldier's, Soldier's Heart especially should be seen as one of the great, you know, one of the great works. I mean, it should be, yes. it should be up there with, you know, Mouse and. and yeah. If it's not in a few too. years, I'm going to be very angry. That should be in every school curriculum from elementary on up. And it should be in every library. Yeah, it should. Whether it is or not is another matter. I mean, yeah. one of the things we've talked about on the podcast often are the dynamics sometimes, the strange dynamics that go into any kind of canon formation, uh, specifically for us when it comes to comics. Hmm. How would you characterize those dynamics? Or can they be? Well, 
I mean, my personal feeling is that there are certain books that I guess have this kind of pylon experience where they they take off with with readers or uses in the classroom, and because others are using it, then uh, or some people are using it, then others will. And so that becomes, in many ways, kind of a hot commodity. So someone learns that you know other instructors are using a particular graphic novel or comic text in the classroom, and then they'll use it as well. And, and sometimes these are in classes that are training future teachers, and so they're going to be using what they were taught in in their classroom experience. Uh, and, and sometimes this happens to the exclusion, unfortunately, of other texts that could do at least just as well on a particular topic or subject matter, uh, but just doesn't seem to get the kind of attention. And, and so there are certain books that seem to be taught over and over again, and, and for good reason, but because they're taught over and over and over again, they're like the first thing that people think of. And so it kind of limits the expansion of including other stories within a particular syllabus. Well, I think that this speaks to the need for and the responsibility that teachers have, and I'm a teacher too, so I'm mm -hmm. not excluding myself from this, to be inclusive mm -hmm. and and to think about representation as well. Mm -hmm. Because representation is really important when you are a student of any age, right? You see yourself or you see people who don't look like whatever the dominant group is. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking of this in the way that women get written out of every field's history all the time. And we're always finding out that there were women in the space program and women who were pioneering computer programmers and women who were pioneering geneticists, et cetera. We get, I, 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 I see women getting written out of comics history. I see women getting written out of rock and roll history all the time. Right. And it's a conscious, constant battle to pull those stories back up to the surface and put them in front of people. So that's a responsibility I don't take lightly as a teacher myself. I teach illustration mostly. So when I'm showing illustration work, I, I, and, you know, I'm not just showing students illustration. I'm showing them all kinds of art. I'm always trying to look beyond whatever the quote canon is. And I really put canon in quotes because yes, there are certain things that are canonical, but I don't believe there's any one canon mm -hmm. in any art form, frankly. I think there are works that are iconic that everyone should know, but you, you've got to keep that list flexible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a, um, you're, I'm just reminded of this, this recent book that, uh, um, a couple of scholars, Bart Beatty and Benjamin Wu, did called the greatest comic book of all time, in which they they look specifically at the kind of what what works are getting the academic attention uh, by doing a kind of statistical study of uh, academic journals to see who's who's getting the the focus. And you know, you've got you've got Art Spiegelman and Alan Moore really are at the top. Um, Marjan Satrapi. Uh, and um is is a bit below them and and then there's a really really long tail following that that kind of concentration and i think that speaks to what Der derek was saying that there's a kind of bandwagon that happens when some once people start teaching something or something starts getting attention and then that becomes it gets a critical mass that becomes the thing that every that everybody focuses on or or uses at least I think it's really – all of those people that you just mentioned are absolutely necessary yeah. to teach and to talk about. But I just think it's necessary to also stay aware of what else is coming out. Like, um, mm -hmm. for example, I just read th – there's a book that's about to come out called The Best We Could Do by the cartoonist T. Bui. And it's about her family's history and experience in Vietnam. Mm. They came here in 1978. Her first memories are of being on a, a very unseaworthy boat wow. out of Vietnam in the middle of the night when she was three years old. But it's it's only glancingly about America's involvement with Vietnam. And what it actually does is – oh, my daughter just walked in the room. So you may hear a small voice. <laughs> yeah, you better before she turns off my Skype call. Hi. <laughs> uh, but – so one thing that, that is so fascinating about it, is it, to me, it's analogous to Persepolis in some ways. Yes, I'm in the office. <laughs> no, no. 
<laughs> Sorry, guys. No, that's that okay. is not the first time this podcast has made a child cry. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't feel you have to edit any of that out. Um, she likes to watch Peppa Pig on my iPad, which is how I'm talking to you through my iPad. So, you know, she was staring at it like, why do you have my Peppa Pig? <laughs> <laughs> at any rate, uh, this book to me, the best we could do could be in the same way that Persepolis taught a lot of people who wouldn't have otherwise known anything about Persian history. Mm. Uh, I feel that this book could do that about the last century, century and a half of Vietnamese history. Mm -hmm. And for all of our terrible history of involvement with Vietnam, we don't know anything about that place. Right. No. And, and that war is passing out of American consciousness anyway. Right. We're in danger of forgetting about our own, our own time period there. But this book goes so much deeper than that. And it's also very personal. So that's a book, for example, that I would tell people to look for. You know, Soldier's yeah. Heart would be another one. Mm -hmm. I think it's just important to remember that comics is a constantly expanding art form. In fact, there's, I mean, there's so much out there now. Most of us can't keep up. I'm sure you've had that problem. Oh. Mm -hmm. Every single week, yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the good news about that is that now, whereas before, like, at least 95% of it was garbage, now probably only 90% of it is garbage. That 10% is pretty big, too. Yeah. Yeah. The odds are more in our favor for decent podcast episodes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, let's talk about um, or more about your role as a teacher. So now you teach classes at SAW, Sequential Artists Workshop, right? Yes, and also University of Florida. Okay. So um, in, in fact, when um, when I was down in Gainesville several months ago, I, I'm sorry that I didn't get to, to meet you. I was glad to, to meet Tom in person. Uh, but unfortunately, I guess one of you had to stay home with your daughter, and it, yeah. it was you. Although you did a fabulous cake. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I thought that was really hilarious that they made a cake out of my image. Oh, so you didn't intend for that uh, to, to be made into a cake? They never told me your illustration will be on a cake. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I, I took totally pictures honored. of it and posted it to uh, my Facebook page. Oh, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but tell us a bit about the courses that you teach at Florida and at SAW. Uh, so I teach illustration for the most part. At SAW, I also teach figure drawing. So I, I will also say that giving me a figure drawing class is the closest you can get to making me the ruler of a small island nation. <laughs> I become a strutting little dictator. It's the only time that I'm not completely nice as a teacher uh, when teaching figure drawing. The cartoonist Sean Ford dubbed my class the figure drawing gulag, which I think is really <laughs> funny. I think that was Sean that said that. I asked him recently and he was like, yeah, that was me. <laughs> uh, so uh, I... The classes are kind of, they're roughly the same, the illustration classes, although the student body is really different. So at UF, I have non-majors. This past year, I had people who were art minors, and that was the first time I had really had anybody in my class who was actually doing art as a study outside of my class. Mm -hmm. But I get a lot of people who have no background at all, so I have to kind of give them a little bit of everything including stuff that I'm you know, not really qualified to teach. And then I can't teach them certain things, like I really can't teach them color theory. Because color theory, the way it's taught in art schools is kind of like a form of hypnosis. And it's a very specific curriculum. You know, if you learn the, the kind of Bauhaus Black Mountain College version of color theory, which I don't know if there's another one. You know, you use the Albers and the Itten exercises and, and it drives you crazy and then you don't remember how you did it. You don't remember anything you did, and but somehow all of that knowledge is ingrained. That's what I mean when I say it's like hypnosis. Okay. I can't teach that. But I, I end up teaching kind of basic principles of two-dimensional design, handling of paint, kind of stealthily trying to get them to sharpen their aesthetic sensibilities without imposing my own taste on them, which is a very fine line. And I'm just honest about giving them my my biased opinion. You know, I say it at the outset, everything I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you because I like it. So you're going to get my taste. I need you to, to develop your own taste as well. Hmm. So that's a big part of what I do at UF. At SAW, it's similar. 
but because they're already in an art program and a lot of them, well, sometimes we get people who already have art degrees in our full year program. Uh, I can kind of push them a little harder in that way. Well, in what ways might your uh, work in the classroom, working with others, come back to, to feed your own work, your own comics? Well, it feeds my illustration more than anything else. Uh, not so much my comics, because I'm not really teaching comics. Um, it feeds my uh, problem-solving abilities in a different way. Because now, instead of just having my own process to think about, I'm looking at, you know anywhere from six to 18 people's problem solving processes. And it's always interesting to me to see how they solve a problem. That's a really satisfying thing to see as an illustration teacher. You give everybody the same problem and you get a vast range of different solutions to this problem, including uh, people who don't understand that it's a problem to be solved all the way up to people who have done things that are completely surprising which is, I think, also what an art director hopes for when they assign uh, something to an illustrator, right? But I get to see it replicated multiple times. So seeing that, I can also ask myself very discreetly, how would I have solved this problem? And then I have to keep my mouth shut. I can't tell the students how I would have solved the problem. That's not fair game. Mm -hmm. But you can see how that would sharpen my own reflexes a lot. Right. Are you? Do you ever use your own work in class, or are you tempted to use your own published work in class? I'll show it to them, but I've actually uh, not been as proactive about that as I even really should be. I mean, you know, you should show your students what you do so they know who you are and what they're getting. You shouldn't go too crazy with that, though. I had one teacher in school who used to do stuff like show us interminable slideshows of his work, including pictures of his brushes. He would, like, go over class time. I remember leaving early because I had a job. I was like, I have to go to work now. I can't look at pictures of your damn brushes. And he got mad at me and he, he lowered my grade. I was like, dude, I know what a fucking Kalinsky Sable number 10 looks like. <laughs> so, you know, you, you, you don't want to be arrogant with your students, but you certainly need to tell them who you are. Much like as a dancer, you know, it's really important for my students to be able to see me perform because otherwise, how would they know whether they want to study with me or not? Mm -hmm. maybe I'm not their style. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. I think there's a fine line to be drawn between, you know, show, showing your, that you, you are a person who should be teaching the class versus the, the kind of uh, ego gratification that can happen in those, <laughs> those situations that that allows for. Yeah, definitely. That guy was the exception, luckily. <laughs> I just always remember that I don't know if you're familiar with the the movie The Freshman with uh, Matthew Broderick, where he's taking a film class and the teacher is describing each of the textbooks in the class and and they are all by him. Yeah. And <laughs> and and but he refers to himself as the third in the third person each time he mentions. Oh God. One <laughs> I, I I hate to think that that's accurate, but it probably it is. is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love how quickly you can answer that. <laughs> it is. It's totally accurate. <laughs> The only, um, I guess, creative writing class or anything approximating a creative writing class that I took, it was as an undergraduate, and I was uh, only in there for one day. Uh, and it was one of these once-a-week, three-hour classes, and it, it was on fiction writing. And after the first 15 minutes where we went over the syllabus, the rest of the class was devoted to the professor sharing her poetry with us. Oh, no, no. And this is a fiction writing class. And so the vast majority of what we did in class, the entire takeaway for me, is this is a person who is a poet, and we should appreciate her poetry. So I dropped the class after that. Uh, I think that was wise. Yeah. But that, that's, that's my only experience with, uh, at least creatively, a self-indulgent professor. <laughs> yeah. Like I said, it's a very fine line. <laughs> yeah. Right. Now, Leela, you've mentioned uh, two or three times during this conversation um, a future work that y you have. Now, is this going to be something uh, more like uh, Untersachen, a work of fiction? Yes, very much so. 
And what could you tell us about that without giving things away that you shouldn't be giving away? <laughs> well, you know, it's so early that I don't think I'm going to be spoiling anything by just giving you a really basic idea of what it is. It's uh, a work of fiction set in New York City during the Second World War. And it's a, mostly about stuff happening on the home front, so to speak, although it touches on things that happen in Europe as well. And there's a subplot about women's wrestling because I got really into drawing wrestlers after I did that Mountain Goats illustration project. <laughs> um, I, I really just didn't want to stop drawing wrestlers. It just kept coming up. <laughs> um, and I feel like that's all I can really say right now. But if you follow me on Instagram, I do occasionally post process sketches and notes that I'm taking so I'm not secretive about what I work on. I don't feel like I'm jinxing anything by talking about it. There's just not a lot to say yet. So from okay, for, so from what you described, it one of the things that immediately struck me is that you know this is kind of a period piece, just as Untersanken was. Do you feel that at least with your fiction writing, um, more comfortable, or you get more enjoyment uh, about writing about a particular past time, environment, culture? Then you do something, setting something in a contemporary period. Right now, yeah. I mean, that may change at any time. But I'm really interested in history for a number of reasons. I find it a refuge from the contemporary world for a lot of ways. Um, I also think you can learn about, you can learn a lot about your own time period by looking at the past. I think anyone who works with historical material will tell you that it's not really, I mean, it is really about that time period, but it's also about us mm -hmm. now, you know? I mean, hell, the creators of Battlestar Galactica, the, the reboot of Battlestar Galactica said that. So it, it doesn't even have to be about history. It just can be a different time and place, you know? We're always talking about our own time period in some way. But I find history really fascinating. I also uh, am very interested, and I, I know I've said this many times before, but I think it bears repeating. I'm very interested in time periods that we have turned into mythology. Um, I like stories that, that go deeper into those time periods and talk about real human experiences that bust the mythology apart. So, for example, Deadwood would, would be an example of that. Mad Men would be another. Mm -hmm. you know? Um and I guess, you know, I'm thinking about MASH, which wasn't exactly sort of set in another time, but not really. I mean, it was made during Vietnam, but it was set during the Korean War, but it was really about Vietnam, you know. Right. Uh, just talking about human interaction and human condition and human experience in these situations that we've turned into cliche and very broad strokes, I think is a very healing and interesting way to tell a story and can be very, very fierce as well. You'll notice it also destabilizes people. There are people who don't know how to react to certain kinds of stories in that vein, right? Like um, if you look at the way some people react to Mad Men, I know people who won't watch it because they say, oh, it's so sexist. It's so racist. That's the point. Right. Partially. Right. It's, if you go away from it thinking that's the only point, then you haven't really watched it. But that's a big part of it. Talk about that time period without flinching. And look at those things without flinching or, or idealizing or writing happy endings for people. Now, now the, in, early in that answer, you mentioned a, uh, a, a Mountain Goats project. Now I'm really fascinated with this. Uh, <laughs> I'd, because I've never heard of this, so th there was some something to do with their album "Beat the Champ." Yeah, I did the cover and lyric booklet art for that record. Oh, okay. And oh, it, I love it, that album. It's a great <laughs> record. It's entirely wrestling themed. Right. And it was that was made very explicit from the outset. Everything you are going to do for this record will be wrestling themed. So I thought it was really cool that I was the person who got hired to do that because I don't think that I'm necessarily if you if you look at my work. <laughs> That might not be the first thing that comes to mind, but I was really psyched, and it it really had a positive impact on on how I work now. 
Hmm. Oh, I never realized you did the cover of that album. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at it right now. Oh. I wonder how many of my friends have that record and don't know that that's me. <laughs> <laughs> It is entirely possible to know me and not know that that's my art. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, on the topic of music, I, this this brings me back to your uh, your recent book. One piece in there that seems to stand out from from everything else, just and I think tonally, uh, is live drawing the Eurovision Song <laughs> Contest. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, th- <laughs> this seems to be okay. Wh- how do I put this? Where every other comic in this book has a heaviness to some degree um you don't find that here i mean here it's that you're just having a good time and the very title itself suggests that i'm just going to do this and see where it goes yeah and and i should point out also there's a page missing um, oh in 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 this story in in that piece yeah yeah that should be in there and actually it's not a heavy page but because missing that page interferes with the rhythm of the piece um, it might have read a little more heavily because the last, if actually the last page, I do go a little bit dark where, I mean, I redrew a panel from Otto Dix's Krieg triptych <laughs> in that, in that piece. Yeah. Uh, and I talk about that Neubauten album that's completely about world war one, but yeah, I, so I have a, a deep, not so secret love for the Eurovision song contest, but not so much the contemporary one. I, I really like going back and watching old Eurovision videos. They're just these parades of poor taste. They, it's <laughs> it's bizarre. It's the World Cup of bad pop music. Yeah. Uh, or the Olympics, maybe. I don't know. It's so insane. And, and in much the same way that I think probably the World Cup and the Olympics are, it's, I feel like it's a substitute for war. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Maybe not even always a substitute. I mean, didn't someone from Ukraine win this year, and didn't that cause a lot of consternation? Oh, but yeah. it, it was it was really fun working on that. I just really descended to a, a very deep YouTube hole of of Eurovision videos. I found myself in a cafe watching that Lordy video with headphones on. Do you remember Lordy? Did you see that? Yeah. They don't make it into the piece, but boy, and they won, right? Didn't they win? Hmm. I don't remember. <laughs> well, my secret opinion of all heavy metal is that it's actually all basically lordy. <laughs> 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 well, so for for those that don't know, I, I'm actually, um, like most people, a big music obsessive, too. And I had a radio show for years and my whole, you know, so much of my creative being was formed in in loving music and being into all kinds of different music. But Eurovision was kind of a more recent discovery for me. Mm-hmm. I also am a big fan of any kind of human endeavor. Um, I love grand artistic failure a lot. I love music made by people that shouldn't be making music. So Eurovision is kind of a great example of that. <laughs> and the problem that I have with the newer stuff is that it's boring precisely because it's too quote unquote good. It's just too much like bland auto-tuned pop music now. But if you go, I mean, this is not so much true, actually, though, if you look at the qualifiers. I'm really going on way too much about Eurovision now, aren't I? <laughs> See what you did? See what you opened up? You opened the Pandora's box of Eurovision. That's okay. What's at the bottom? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that piece ran on the nib the week they got shut down last year. So were there, were there other cartoonists involved? Uh, I had pitched it uh, on my own. There was somebody, an Irish cartoonist, who did a piece that was just a very straightforward sort of here's what the Eurovision Song Contest is, check it out kind of piece that was just a Mm one-pager. Whereas I wanted to talk about, I I wanted to try live drawing something. That also turned out to be an experiment that wasn't so interesting for me in the end. It was fun, but... I don't think live drawing is really where I live as an artist. Hmm. And I also, uh, I was editorially steered away, let's say, from giving my full opinion on Eurovision. Hmm. Why so? (laughs) It was, uh, to be diplomatic, it was considered undiplomatic. Oh. (laughs) (laughs) I was like, what? Come on. 
nobody takes this thing seriously. It's Eurovision. Yeah. <laughs> also, you know, there were things that I, I wish I'd had sort of time to talk about. They didn't really fit the live drawing um, concept. Uh-huh. Like I could have talked about how amazing Terry Wogan was. He was, he's like an institution. He just died this past year. I haven't even begun to delve into his full career as a radio and TV presenter, but he was this great Irish radio and TV guy who he was, I guess he was the British presenter for Eurovision for a long time. And, and so if you watch Eurovision videos from, see, here we are, we're still. (laughs) Yeah. Pandora's box is deep. It's very, very deep. (laughs) Lordy isn't even anywhere near the bottom, frankly. We can stop talking about Eurovision. <laughs> <laughs> you stop. You stop midpoint, though. <laughs> All I'm going to say is just look up Eurovision videos from the '90s, the British broadcast, and you can hear Terry Wogan's fantastically dry commentary on them. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe this is a future comics project for you. No, no. <laughs> I'm only getting more serious. I save the funny stuff for outside my work life. Uh-huh. <laughs> Who knows? Never say never. Well, Leela, I want to thank you for taking the time and uh, talking with us about your new book, We All Wish for Deadly Force, uh, your other work, Eurovision and otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Thanks. It was a lot of fun. Uh, take care, guys. Uh, that that was a good that was a good lively conversation that uh, I think you pulled the plug on before it degraded too much <laughs> into the Eurovision Song Contest. But, uh, that was it was fun to talk about. Yeah, it was. I, I didn't realize when I asked the question about Eurovision where it was going, <laughs> but uh, I thought that that might have been a lighter way of ending because you know we started off with that first story, which you know is all about what she experienced with the loss of her daughter. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and this is a powerful collection of stories. Uh, our listeners should definitely check out We All Wish for Deadly Forest. And in fact, as we pointed out at the top of the show, you can find that book now at 30% off of the cover price by going to the website of our sponsor, Discount Comic Book Service. So right now, as you're listening to this, go to a browser and type in the URL dcbservice.com, do a search for Leela Corman or We All Wish for Deadly Force, and you'll find it at 30% off. You can't beat that price. And after you do get your copy of Leela's book, get in touch with us and let us know what you think about the interview. If you go to the website, comicsalternative.com, you'll find that you can leave us a voice message through the wonders of SpeakPipe, which is really easy to use. Or you can call us the old-fashioned way. Our phone number is 4153-COMICS. That's 415-326-6427. That's right, or you can get a hold of us by email. We are two guys at comicsalternative.com. Or you can get a hold of us individually. I'm Andy at comicsalternative.com. And I'm Derek at comicsalternative.com. And we have our Twitter feed where we announce new content of the podcast as well as updates to the blog. Check out the Twitter feed at the number two guys with PhDs. That's right. You know, but you can also find us on Facebook as well and Tumblr, Instagram, Google Plus, Goodreads, Pinterest, and YouTube. You can subscribe to the podcast through iTunes. You can stream us on Stitcher. You can also find us on TuneIn. We're also available on Spotify and, if you're an Android user, on Google Play Music. But you know, you can find every single one of our episodes as well as the review and the comics-related commentary that we post on our blog by going to our website, comicsalternative.com. That's right. All the ways to get a hold of us and let us know how we're doing. That's right. And we do like to hear from you, and we have other great interviews in the days to come, so listen up for those. Until then, I'm Derek. And I'm Andy. See ya.